of the Bioarchaeology Lab uh, at the Tehran Institute and the contribution of these uh, uh, animal uh, osteological reference collections for uh, archaeozoological studies in, in Iran. And uh, here uh, I'm uh, showing just uh, as a first picture all my group in, in Iran and a picture of, uh, um, of, the, of the lab, but we will come back to, to that. Uh, okay, it begins well. I cannot <laughs> go from one to another. Oh, okay, I see. So first of all, I, I wanted to, to begin this talk with the question of bioarchaeology and the definition, what we are talking when we are talking about bioarchaeology. I think this is an important question because there are many um, different uh, people understand different things from bioarchaeology, but what I, I'm I'm talking about is all, all these fields um, that in, are included in bioarchaeology. Uh, the, the first that I, I, I put in the first, but this is because it's my discipline, it's archaeozoology, then uh, archaeobotany, physical anthropology, and uh, biogeochemistry that I wrote in French, excuse me. And each of these uh, big fields, they have uh, subfields, subspecialties, and um, since uh, we are talking about archaeozoology today, um, I, I would like to, to attract your attention on the vast uh, uh, fields of specialty that is included in archaeozoology that includes basically two big fields uh, regarding vertebrates and invertebrates. And within the vertebrates, we have the uh, mammals, we have birds, we have amphibian reptiles, which is uh, a herpetology, um, uh, fish. Uh, these are basically the vertebrates. And then uh, we have the invertebrates that are represented by the mollusks, the insects, and the parasites. I have put some pictures here to represent each of these fields. And uh, also what uh, we include in, in bioarchaeology are all the um, uh, molecular analysis like uh, isotope analysis, protein analysis, and DNA. So this is the big field of bioarchaeology. But today we are focusing more on uh, bone remains, osteological remains, and how they, they, they can uh, contribute to the understanding of interactions between humans and environments. And so uh, if you take, for example, this, uh, this bone, which is um, a mandible uh, composed of partly of bone and tooth uh, of a sheep or goat. And um, so here uh, we have different information uh, with, with different levels of, of information that can be extracted from this single bone. Of course, the first information is the context, and we are all archaeologists, and uh, of course, archaeology is the, 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 the base and uh, the most important uh, uh, source of information. Um, then this, the, so, so once we know where, where this, ha this bone has come from, uh, we can work on the other aspects, like for the identity, origin, evolution uh, of this animal. Uh, that uh, means you have to make an identification, taxonomic spe specific identification of this animal. You can learn about its morphology, sex, age, and uh, about environmental conditions, if there has been some anthropogenic uh, modifications, if this uh, bone has been used as a raw material, for example, for a tool or for, for, for objects. And um, how people have exploited these, these bones. Is, does this bone come from a hunting activity, herding activity? Uh, does it uh, say something about domestication, about subsistence practices? And um, of course, other things that are extremely important, uh, I come back to the context, is the excavation method, which is very important in, in how we, we can uh, get information from these, these uh, uh, bones, assemblages of bones. If you make an a stratigraphic, for example, ex uh, excavation, or if you make an extensive excavation, if you make sieving or not, you will have different type of information that will come out of that. 
And um, of course, another field which is extremely important in, uh, in our, uh, uh, our archaeozoology is anatomy. Uh, and anatomy means, uh, first of all, um, observation of the morphology and description of it. So this, this is the, one of the basic uh, important fields uh, of knowledge that we refer to. And um, of course, within these last, uh, last uh, 40 years of development of archaeozoological studies, we have, uh, we have an important uh, contribution of statistical uh, methods in analyzing the, uh, the, the, our data uh, quantitatively and qualitatively. And also the metric analysis have uh, very much developed and have given rise to various uh, uh, sub-methods like the morphometric geometrics that is very much now applied to, to the osteological um, assemblages. And of course, the molecular analysis, for, uh, the one that everybody uh, uses and knows most is the C14 dating, but there are other isotopic analyses like uh, the um, carbon and oxygen and strontium analysis that you can see now that are more and more applied. And more new ones are proteomic or zooms, known as zooms, and of course, ancient DNA. So this is all the set of the things that we can do with these uh, um, ancient uh, um, bones. So coming to, to Iran, I, and before going into the, the collections, I wanted just to, to show you how was the situation in, in this country. Uh, regarding the archaeological studies and um, compared to, to adjacent uh, regions. Um, and um, uh, so uh, it is obvious that you can see that uh, there are many, many um, uh, archaeological studies in this uh, in Iran, and this is partly due to the uh, um, importance of, of local and domestic investigations during this last um, 30 years, I would say, compared to the uh, other countries uh, surrounding Iran, maybe, where the, 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 the local investigations are uh, uh, still uh, not as important. So this, this is something important that I will uh, come back to, but it was just to give you uh, a picture of the, of the situation. So coming to the collections, I would say that um, um, my, uh, since I'm, I'm talking about my, my experience in Iran, so in 1993, uh, I began my, my, my PhD and I went to Iran to, to work on, uh, on, on some assemblages. And I, um, I came to, to work in the Institute of Archaeology. Uh, under the direction of uh, Dr. Salehi. Unfortunately, he, he died several years uh, after my beginning of my work, but he was the one who really encouraged me and helped me, and so I want really to acknowledge him. And uh, so uh, basically I, I was faced with uh, tons of bones, but with no uh, comparative collections, and this was a, a big problem. So I began by myself to, 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 to make a small lab, a comparative lab, um, and uh, this was this happened because uh, because I had uh, on my background I had I was already in France and I could uh, rely on on the uh, help of the Natural History Museum and especially my team, uh, the Archaeology Lab uh, at the museum, who with whom I made some exchange of skeletons and I could bring them to Iran so so I had some comparative uh, collections and this is something important I would uh, insist on the, the importance of these um, museums these natural history museums uh, uh, that are um, uh, housing these uh, uh, modern skeletons uh, modern collections comparative collections uh, that are extremely useful for uh, archaeozoologists. And uh, the other message I would really like to, to pass here is that uh, it, is, it was because I was working in the Natural History Museum of Paris for several years before that uh, I was inspired by good uh, practices, by the knowledge of, 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 of preparing and uh, collecting uh, skeletons and animals and preparing them and, and building these comparative collections. So this is something I, I wanted to, to, to say that it is, um, it is not uh, uh, 
uh, spontaneously that you can do these things. You need it really to have this background of knowledge and to, to go uh, to go uh, into this kind of adventure by, by knowing what, what are the best practices to, to, to follow. And uh, of course, I was already working in, in Paris, and this is a, a picture of our collections in our osteological collections, uh, archaeology lab in uh, Paris. This is part of the a picture that is showing just part of the collections. But uh, again, uh, what you can see here was extremely inspiring for me to, to work uh, uh, in Iran and to build something um, in Iran not having the same, of, of course, uh, the same um, uh, means and the same uh, possibilities, but at least uh, it, it, I had this this model in 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 my in 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 the background. So, with this, I began accept these exchanges with the museum and my my lab that uh, helped me to have the first skeletons, comparative collection collections that I had. I began to build myself collections, so it meant that I went in the field in different regions uh, of Iran and I collected for uh, in, for beginning sheep and goat because these are the most uh, abundant uh, species that you can find in the assemblages. So I began to to collect modern sheep and goat and to build up a local uh, a, a, a local assemblage, of course, with the, using the, the, the protocols um, and uh, collecting all the information about the animals before slaughtering them and uh, and using them as a collection. So all these collections are now in in Iran. And um, uh, along that, I, I had also, I was going into markets and getting, for example, fish and uh, birds uh, or uh, having exchange with hunters and working with the department also of environment for getting some wild animals that of course were not uh, easy to to get in, um, I mean, uh, 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 in, in the normal life, I mean, you cannot go to a butcher and and, and buy buy a, a gazelle. So you had to have these interactions with different institutions. So um, in 1997 to uh, um, 2010, for different reasons, the 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 lab uh, that I had first built in the uh, Institute of Archaeology had to be moved to my house. And for several years, I worked in the house. I trained, I began to train um, students in the house. And uh, despite my family not being really happy to have all these bones in the house, but uh, we, we, we did it. And uh, for several years, I was working in, in, in one of the rooms of my house in Tehran and uh, working with students. And um, in the same time, uh, this training was was going on in the field. Uh, I, I participated in several um, several uh, campaigns of excavation in uh, that was organized by the Institute of Archaeology of the University of Tehran, and we were working uh, in the in the field for uh, the collect methods and. Um, like the sieving that like you can see here. And we had also sessions of training of uh, archaeozoology and osteology. But uh, a turning point was in 2010, when uh, with the help of uh, Dr. Uh, Heide Lale, who is a professor at the uh, University of Tehran, uh, we got a fund from the ICRP, which is an Iranian uh, uh, research program from the Ministry of Science, Research and Technology, and uh, we got this fund to 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 work on uh, bioarchaeology of Iran, and also uh, the the idea was training uh, uh, students and also uh, con the constitution of a lab um, uh, at the Institute of Archaeology, actually next to the uh, in another building next to the. Um, Institute of Archaeology. So this this was really a, a turning point, uh, I would say, because then we had a, a program, uh, we had students to 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 work with, and uh, we had a, a place uh, to to settle. So um, this began with seminars, set of set seminars from 2010 to 2011, where uh, I there was. Uh, different uh, trainings. Uh, this is my, my team uh, at the time. 
uh, where we had theoretical and uh, practical training of different methods of archaeozoology using, uh, um, uh, of course, the archaeological assemblages and also uh, preparing um, uh, preparing uh, skeletons of uh, modern animals. And um, this is just to, to show you that the, the question is extremely uh, important, uh, for example, for a region like Iran, where we have a very, very high uh, biodiversity. Actually, it is considered as a hotspot of biodiversity. And here you can see some of the uh, emblematic uh, animals of this region, like the, the wild goat, the hemians, uh, gazelles, the cheetah, that are extremely endangered uh, species, uh, hyenas, salamanders, that are uh, endemic uh, species. Um, and so it, it is a, a very difficult task, actually, to, to build a, a collection for this region because of this high di diversity. And uh, uh, this was what we, we tried to do. Um, during all these years that I've been trying to, to work with these students. So this, these are some images where you can see, for example, through the a collaboration with the Department of em Environment, uh, we got a set of um, docks, different type of docks, and uh, the students here are preparing this, these docks. And now we have a very good collection of docks of the, the Caspian region. But uh, of course, we are far from having the whole uh, biodiversity uh, of Iran. It is uh, practically impossible in 10 years. Uh, museums like, like France uh, have uh, 200, 300 years of work before uh, having the collections that they have. So, so we, are, we are really in, in the beginning of, of a whole work, but we are... Um, we are trying to, to do our best. Here you are saying that we are preparing some legs of uh, uh, wild goats and uh, wild sheep and gazelles. So we have at least represented these animals in uh, our uh, collections. And also uh, uh, we, we, we built up a database uh, of these uh, skeletons, a, a very uh, complete database a documented database of each single bone uh, and the description of the bone, whether it's right, left, uh, complete, not complete, etc. And so far, we have 800 modern vertebrate specimens now in this lab, which is a very good number, I think, for beginning to, to work with archaeozoological uh, material. And so this is the, the uh, a recent picture of uh, this lab where uh, we have a representation of major um, herbivores, domestic and wild, and uh, we can at least work uh, with the routine uh, assemblages. And when we have really big problems that we cannot solve, of course, we try to export to France with authorizations, of course, and to uh, identify with the collections of the Natural History Museum in France. So uh, basically, uh, these collections have uh, allowed us to, to study a large set of archaeozoological uh, uh, assemblages. You can see this, this map with all the name of, of the sites. And uh, the, the graph on the left shows the distribution of these uh, sites and the information we have for uh, different periods uh, of time. And uh, um, you can see that we can cover basically all the periods of, of the Iranian history during the Holocene through the, the, the work that we have done uh, these last 11 years with this group at the, um, at the um, uh, Bioarchaeology Lab that I will call Balut from now on. But uh, this uh, Balut group is not only uh, working in Iran, we uh, have uh, gone in different countries also, in Georgia, Azerbaijan, uh, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, we have, my team have worked also in these countries. So this is also something I'm very happy of because we have uh, trained uh, people who can now uh, be independent and work by themselves and, and uh, contribute to the archaeology of adjacent areas in uh, uh, near Iran. 
in parallel to, to the work we did in uh, the Institute of Archaeology, we had another uh, activity uh, which is uh, done uh, also by, by this team at the uh, National Museum of Iran. And this is something also extremely important. The National Museum of Iran is housing many, um, uh, a large set of uh, uh, archaeological assemblages that were there from before uh, the Iranian revolution when there were many different uh, um, archaeological uh, excavations by foreign groups uh, that were done in Iran. And so they were housing these uh, uh, assemblages in uh, the museum that were kept uh, very uh, carefully and uh, but they were not uh, they were not uh, curated unfortunately so for the last um, uh, maybe 20 years i've been uh, um, uh, acting in in um, convincing the directors of the uh, national museum that there is a big need in curating these these osteological uh, human and animal collections because they are they are part of the heritage uh, the natural and cultural heritage of the country as in other countries of the world where these assemblages are very carefully kept and curated so um, at the end uh, all this effort led to the creation of a department of osteology uh, under the direction of dr jebrail nokande whom i'm very very grateful for his help and support and uh, so in 2011, when we were working in the Institute of Archaeology, the same group was in the same time working in the uh, National Museum of Iran. You can see here just pictures of the, 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 the state of the conservation of these uh, animal or, or human bones in the, in the museum. Uh, and uh, they were packed in this way, and uh, so so the the idea for maybe for forty years, and uh, they were there, and uh, not, nothing has moved. So the, some were collapsed, some were collapsing, and some needed really uh, curation. So what we began to to do it was to to work with this group and to repack everything, re document everything uh, especially it was a, a very important to repack because many of the plastic bags were in very different in very bad bad situation and we had to uh, to to secure all these uh, assemblages so this is the the work that we did during uh, all these years with this group and uh, some of the other issues of course were that uh, we had to, to, to read these tags and uh, some were very written by hand and it was very difficult uh, in different languages like in Italian or, or uh, even in Russian we had some. And uh, the other issue was that the, many of the archaeologists were no more there and we had to reconnect to these people or to their institutions to, 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 to get the, the information. So it was a real archivistic uh, work uh, that uh, all this group did uh, for these uh, assemblages during all these years. And here are different steps of the work. So we, we succeeded uh, to, to get, you know, boxes to, to re, 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 repack all these uh, various assemblages. And of course, we made a database that it's existing now. And uh, we got, uh, we got uh, awarded from the, the museum for all the work. Uh, that's the group had done. So just a few pictures that you see, there are exceptional human remains uh, in these collections. The Tepe Abdel Hossein is one of the very early uh, Neolithic sites in Iran. And uh, these are the type of things that we found in the boxes. And uh, it resulted that uh, the, 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 the skull was now uh, exposed, exhibited in the, in the museum. Uh, it was, uh, of course, one of the, the nice things that uh, could be done through our activities. And uh, there are, uh, as you can see, huge assemblages, uh, animal assemblages. These are uh, now equid assemblages that I'm showing from the site of Shahre Umis, that is um, a medieval site. A very important site on the Silk Road networks, and uh, and we are studying these these bones, and um, for several years the, the assemblage is huge as you can as you can see. 
And of course, miracles happen. And in 2021, uh, with the help of Dr. Uh, Nokende, who was in the back of all, everything, he, he managed to get us this proper storages, uh, metallic storages that uh, uh, now are settled in the in the museum and that, that make our uh, funnel assemblages safe and secure for many, many years, hopefully. So uh, now I'm going in this uh, second part of the of the talk, which is the, the the what comes out of all these works and what we have done. So one of the the important things that uh, we did during all these uh, uh, years was um, through the study of these final remains was uh, documenting the chronology, uh, actually of. Uh, various events. One of them is the Neolithic spread. And uh, you can see that uh, it is very clear through the, the, um, the C14 datings that we could do on these animal uh, bones in, in Iran. We have now a very good uh, view of how uh, the Neolithic uh, uh, expansion was, was done in Iran from the Zagros region to the Albors, and this is the schematic view of this spread um, from from the the Zagros and a history of the eastward spread of domestic animals, where you can see that the the capra, which is the goat, was present uh, uh, from the earliest uh, periods in the Zagros, and then it spread uh, to the north. Uh, east and then to the south uh, east of Iran and then came it was followed by the the sheep uh, cattle and um, and pigs so this is uh, a type of contribution we had also we contributed to the understanding of pa past biodiversity of equids uh, Iran is a Iranian plateau is a place for very suitable for the development of, of equids. And um, so we have different uh, species. We have horses, wild horses, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the Persian onager, which is the wild ass, Asiatic wild ass. Uh, we have donkey and uh, we have other species that are now extinct. And uh, these uh, were, we could, uh, identify these species in the final risk, uh, assemblages that uh, we studied. And also an, a very important uh, contribution was uh, the a discovery of these a whole set of, of new taxa uh, that were totally absent uh, 30 years ago. We didn't know about their existence on the Iranian plateau. And uh, we have now 10 new uh, large uh, uh, mammal species that are identified in this uh, part uh, of the globe uh, and uh, that contributes to the understanding of the general bi biodiversity of Eurasia. And <clears throat> other contributions, uh, important contributions for, for the Neolithic studies and the question of domestication, the spread and use of various taxa, the origin of human uh, peopling uh, of the Iranian plateau and connectivity. And uh, we contributed to uh, many um, papers, as you can see here, some examples, uh, which I've, I have put uh, for uh, the understanding of the origins of sheep, cattle, uh, goats, uh, the Iranian, um, I mean, the, the humans on the Iranian plateau and how they spread towards the east. Uh, the question of the domestication of horses, uh, dogs, and the, our last paper is the uh, genomic history of global expansion of, of domestic uh, donkeys, where you can see the contribution of several people of my group, uh, and uh, the importance also, also of, of this uh, uh, eastern regions compared to Africa, which is the origin of the uh, domestication of, of, of uh, donkey. Uh, to the whole story of the uh, donkey domestication. And um, also it, it is, I was, uh, I wanted to also insist on the, on the fact that uh, we are partner of several international projects. Uh, I'm showing here just a, a picture of sheep because we are, for example, partner of the Evo Sheep Project, which is an international project on the makeup of sheep sheep breeds in, in uh, Near East. Um, 
And um, there are various aspects in this project, ge geometric morphometrics, DNA proteomics. And um, so, so my lab and the, the assemblages that we study in Iran are a, a big part of this project. But unfortunately, what I was I wanted to say, and this is one of the other realities that we have to face, difficulties we have to face in Iran, is that we, uh, Iran is under embargo, and so we are partners of these uh, projects, well, but we have no funding. So we are basically working on our own uh, uh, self self uh, uh, self funding uh, to participate in this in this. Uh, project and this is extremely uh, harmful for for our group but uh, we still uh, are hopeful that this will change in the future and um, i wanted to finish the the talk by by talking about uh, about the outreach activities of course we 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 have uh, various uh, outreach activities like the presentation of our work to in different uh, uh, in different groups, like here in the uh, annual activities of the University of Tehran, we always have a stand and we, we show what we have done during that, that year. Uh, and uh, one of the other important, uh, I think, contributions we made uh, maybe to, to, to the to, to the history of Iran is that now archaeology is part of the museums, uh, Iranian museums. Uh, here you can see the permanent showcases that we have at the Natural History Museum of Iran. There are three other uh, places in uh, Iran, other uh, uh, cities where we have showcases of archaeo, uh, I mean, uh, animal bones. But uh, it is very interesting that uh, recently, two years ago, we were contacted by a small museum, Haftape Museum, which is in Khuzestan, uh, to make uh, to make a, a a real contribution, not only showcases on the 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 uh, animal bones, but also on archaeology. What was archaeology? So this uh, small uh, museum, Haftape, um, is um, actually, in, uh, as I said, in South. Uh, uh, west of Iran. It's, it is um, a museum that is named after the site of Haftape, uh, which is uh, an important site of the Elamite uh, civilization. Um, and it has been excavated for now 60 years, I think. The first who, who began to excavate there was uh, um, Dr. Negahban, and uh, now it's Dr. Mufidi that is continuing these, these excavations. And um, so this 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 museum built built up around the the, the discoveries of, of what was found in this uh, in this um, site, and um, something I, I would like here to 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 share with you, which is a bit kitschy, but it was very interesting. It is a film that was made uh, on this uh, museum, and we didn't my group didn't have any intervention. They we discovered this film and um, it, it was very, very, very nice for us to see how they were uh, interested by uh, archaeozoology. So I'm, I'm going to, to put this film for you and trying to, to translate very quickly uh, what it is written in Persian in it. Come and learn the four topics of the Haftafe Museum animal remains. The interaction between human and animals exists from thousand years. These showcases present the role of animals in the Elamite society. The first part of the showcase presents the methods of archaeology and how we can reconstruct the interactions between humans and animals. Animal bones can, can witness how animals were used in various activities for carrying and consumption. Bones were used, also used as raw material for making games, decorative objects, and musical instruments. During the Elamite period, the most exploited animals were domestic cattle, sheep, goat, and donkey for food and work. The showcases shows various elements of these animals and faces left on the bones. Oh, 
sorry. So so that that was that was the, the the film that was kitschy, but it was I think very nice that people see how our activities have an impact also on the on the society. And um, uh, finally, I would like to to introduce you an, another uh, important achievement of my my lab that is this this book, that uh, it's a bilingual uh, book, trilingual actually some part of it also in French. It's mostly in Persian, English, and French. And it's a chronological overview of bioarchaeological activities in Iran. And uh, it is a, a book that was conceived to, to be for, for public. Uh, it's, it is uh, not extremely uh, specialized. So uh, everybody, everybody can read and understand uh, the, the, the history of Iran viewed from the uh, human and animal interactions. So if anybody is interested in that book also, I can provide you with the book because it's not the book that is sold, it's just distributed by the um, National Museum of Iran and the Institute, French Institute of uh, Iranian um, Research in Tehran. So this is it. I wanted just to, to finish my, my, my talk with acknowledgements. Of course, you understood how important the National History uh, Museum, uh, National Museum of Natural History was was uh, important in the building of this uh, uh, collections in, in Iran, and I I'm, uh, have listed the people I would like really to thank, and who have helped me throughout uh, these years. Uh, the University of Tehran, of course, uh, and the people like Heidi Lale, who is the director, the head of the Balut. Um, Lab and Ahmad Al Yuri, who are who is the deputy director, who have helped me and other people in the past, like Mola Salehi and uh, uh, Salehi, who who unfortunately passed away. And in the National Museum, I would like to to thank the head of the museum and other colleagues, and of course my students uh, and research fellows. Who um, who have accompanied me throughout these years, and without whom this could not uh, happen. And uh, finally, I, I I dedicate this talk to these uh, Iranian young scientists who made this happen. Thank you very much.